Can you say amen? amen? We are so fortunate to have brought in the, the best choir in Southern California for our service this morning. And uh, if this were a board meeting, I would be tempted to recommend that we have Bobby Britt and the Laguna Handbills become a part of our church on a regular basis. <laughs> Can you say amen? Matthew, the 28th chapter. Matthew 28, begin there, verse 1. I want you to imagine with me this morning. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. His disciples are sleeping. Pilate is struggling. There's a group of evil men that are gathered together in council. I was looking for a word that described evil men as they were gathering. And I came up with the word vilify. Kind of describes that group that was the evil men that were plotting. Vilify means to speak or write in an abusive, disparaging manner, to utter slanderous and abusive statements against, against and to, to defame. Judas had been betraying him. Judas does not realize it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. They're scattered. They forgot that it was Friday. But Sunday's coming. Jesus is hanging on the cross. His arms and back are lacerated. Those hands, which is so often dispense blessings, have been cruelly nailed to the cross. Those feet, so tireless of ministries of love, were cruelly nailed to the cross. And you know what's, what's so amazing about the crucifixion of Jesus is not that he died, but he died so quickly. Crucifixion was known to last for hours and hours and hours. And part of the problem with crucifixion is they're hanging there, they begin sagging down. And that's why they broke their legs, so it would hasten their death. The disciples are scattered. They forget that it's only Friday and they don't know that Sunday's coming. Jesus nailed to the cross. He's always looking for someone to help. He was then and he is now. And a hopeless thief on the cross receives hope and pardon. The angels watch in amazement as they behold the infinite love of Jesus suffering intense agony of mind, body, and spirit. I want you to remember that when Jesus died on the cross, he experiences what those experience at the very end of time without mercy. And even though he's there on the cross, he still reaches out to a penitent soul to believe. In his dying hour, he remembers his mother and asks John to watch after her. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. 
Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The principalities of powers, darkness are assembled around the cross, casting the hellish shadow of unbelief into the hearts of men. Jesus cannot see through the portals of the tomb. Ellen White describes it very accurately. Paints the picture. He cannot see beyond the tomb. But Sunday's coming. With the terrible weight of the sins of the world, he can't see the Father's reconciling face. That's why he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus feels the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy is no longer available. Jesus experienced what the sinners at the end of time experience just before they're destroyed. The anguish, the separation. Jesus feels that his separation it was so his offense his offensive as he's taken the sins of the world was so great that the separation might be eternal. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. The angels witness the gloom, the despair, the savior's disparaging agony. Suddenly the gloom is lifted from the cross. In a clear, trumpet-like tones that seem to resound throughout creation, Jesus cries out to the Father and utters one last prayer. Jesus looks to the Father and says, It is finished. He closes his eyes and yields his spirit. Thunder rolls and darkness prevails everywhere. Ellen White says that in the thick darkness, God veiled the last human agony of his son. We have a little glimpse from scripture. But Ellen White says in that darkness, it really veiled the agony through which Christ went. The silence of the grave seems to have fallen upon Calvary. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. The veil between the holy and the most holy is rent apart. People are frightened and wonder if this is the end of the world. God's love has been expressed in his justice no less than his mercy. But it's only Friday. And Sunday's coming. Heaven viewed with grief and amazement, Jesus hanging on the cross. Can you imagine the angels looking down, witnessing all of this? There were some wealthy followers of Jesus, Nicodemus and Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, members of the Sanhedrin. They come to help the disciples, and they go to Pilate, and they ask that they might take the body down and give Jesus a proper burial. Neither of these men had openly confessed Jesus prior to this time. Let me tell you, the time to confess Jesus is right now. Don't wait. Now is the acceptable time. The day is the day of salvation. What do you say? Right now. Don't hold back. Don't wait for a better time. Neither of them had accepted openly Jesus prior to this time, but now they come boldly. They know that their precious Jesus has died. It appears to be all over. But it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. They carefully take the body of Jesus and lay him in the tomb. They're sobbing as they say goodbye. Tears are streaming down. They can't believe it's all over. But it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. The sun is settled in the west. It's now Sabbath. Who can enjoy a time of rest at a time like this? 
after all that's happened. Jesus, the hope of the world, is now resting in the tomb. Resting on the Sabbath. The long day of shame, torture is ended. As the setting sun ushered in the Sabbath, Jesus is resting in peace, his work completed. They know it's Sabbath, but they don't realize that Sunday's coming. The priests and the rulers, they were not at rest. They had carried out their purpose in putting Jesus to death, but they didn't feel the sense of victory that they had anticipated. They were harassed with doubts as to what might happen next. That was a never-to-be-forgotten Sabbath to the sorrowing disciples, to the priest, to the ruler, to the scribes and the people. And to the angels watching on, it was an unforgettable Sabbath. The trumpets and musical instruments and the voice of the singers were as loud and clear as usual. But a sense of strangeness pervaded everything. One after another, they talked and whispered about the strange event that had happened. The holy place was now open for everybody to see. The revenge which the priests had thought would be so sweet was already bitterness to them. They could rest little on the Sabbath. Though they wouldn't defile themselves by stepping over a Gentile threshold for fear of defilement, they held a council concerning the body of Christ. Death and the grave must hold him for whom they had crucified. They came together and made plans for securing the sepulcher. A great stone had been placed at the entrance. Solid rock. And across the stone they placed cords, sealing them with the Roman seal. The stone could not be removed without breaking the seal. A guard of 100 soldiers was then stationed around the sepulcher to prevent it from being tampered with. They did all they could to keep the body where it was. You can't hold back Jesus. You can't stop Stop Jesus. He was sealed and secure in his tomb as if it were remaining there throughout all time. They knew that it was Sabbath, but they didn't know that Sunday was coming. The greater the number of soldiers placed around the tomb, the stronger would be the testimony that he had risen. And one of my favorite authors, Ellen White, has written many books, but one of them is Desire of Ages. And she, she pictures, it's in the chapter entitled, The Lord is Risen. It's just a, if you haven't ever picked this book up, it's available, Desire of Ages, Ellen G. White, wonderful story about the life of Jesus. And let me just share with you how she's written this. The night of the first day of the week had worn slowly away. The darkest hour just before daybreak had come. Christ was still a prisoner in his narrow tomb. The great stone was in its place. The Roman seal was unbroken. The Roman guards were keeping their watch, and there were unseen watchers. Hosts of evil angels were gathered about the place. Had it been possible, the prince of darkness with his apostate army would have kept forever sealed the tomb that held the Son of God. But a heavenly host surrounded the sepulcher. Angels that excel in strength were guarding the tomb and waiting to welcome the Prince of Life. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Clothed with the panoply of God, this angel left the heavenly courts. The bright beams of God's glory went before him and illuminated his pathway. I want you to imagine this. 
His countenance was lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They must have just passed out with fear. Now, priests and rulers, where is the power of your guard? Brave soldiers that have never been afraid of you in power are now as captives taken without a sword or spear. The face they look upon is not the face of a mortal warrior. It's the face of the mightiest of the Lord's host. This messenger is he who fills the position from which Satan fell. It's he who on the hills of Bethlehem proclaimed Christ's birth. The earth trembles at his approach. The host of darkness flee, and as he rolls away the stone, heaven seems to come down to the earth. The soldiers see him removing the stone as he would a pebble, and hear him cry, Son of God, come forth. Thy father calls thee. And they see Jesus come forth from the grave. And hear him proclaim over the rent sepulcher, I am the resurrection and the life. And he comes forth in majesty and glory, and the angel hosts bow low, bow, bow low in adoration before the Redeemer and will welcome him with songs of praise. An earthquake marked the hour when Christ laid down his life. And another earthquake witnessed the moment when he took it up in triumph. He who had banished death and the grave came from the tomb with the tread of a conqueror and the reeling of the earth, the flashing of lightning and the roaring of thunder. When he shall come to earth again, he shall shake not the earth only, but also the heavens. The earth shall reel too free and fro. A drunkard shall be removed like a cottage. The heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. What a glorious time that must have been. Those people knew that it was Friday. They didn't realize that Sunday was coming. And just as surely as Jesus came forth out of the grave, just as surely he said, I'm coming back again. He's coming back again. Can you say amen? amen? He's coming for you and he's coming for me. And just like there in the New Testament, people were running to and fro, preoccupied with all the things of this life, thinking it's Friday, but not realizing Sunday's coming. One day so very, very soon, the whole world will see Jesus coming back again in all of his splendor with his angels coming to take his people home. And what Jesus did there on the cross made it possible for each one of us to experience eternal life. And I know that there are some here and there are some on the line that are watching that are being affected by sickness and illness. Even when things look pretty bad. Remember, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And one day soon, Jesus is coming back to put an end to it all. Revelation says the dead in the dead in Christ the, the Bible the New Testament says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive will be caught up in the air. Revelation says that at that time there will be no more tears. Jesus will be with us. On this Easter weekend. I want to ask you, are you ready to meet him? He's ready to take you home. It's a decision. A decision to say, Lo, Jesus, come, take me home. How many want to say that to Jesus? Lo, Jesus, come, take me home. Amen. Shall we pray? Oh, Father, our Father, 
how thankful we are for the story that he is risen. He is risen indeed. And because he has risen, we too can experience eternal life. Thank you for the salvation that we have through him, for the gift that Jesus gave to us, for the forgiveness of sin. And Father, we pray for the same power that resurrected Jesus to work within each one of our lives with a resurrection power enabling us to live victorious, enabling us to keep our eyes fastened on Jesus and by beholding, become changed. Father, that's our prayer. We want to be among that group that will look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We've long waited for him, and now he will take us home. Father, may that day come soon, and may that be our experience. We pray in the wonderful, the powerful, the loving name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.